Hey folks, Patrick Brewer here, Zero Emission Vehicle Fleet Advisor for the Clean BC Go Electric Fleets program. Today's presentation is by Sam Clark. Now with GridServe, he was one of the entrepreneurs and innovators when it comes to fleet electrification. I think you're really going to enjoy his presentation and hear a little bit about his journey. Let's, let's see what Sam has to say, shall we? Um, so yeah, hello everybody. Um, thank you for uh, listening to me today and my presentation on, on all things EV. Um, just as by way of uh, introduction and summary of what I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to give a little bit of introduction about myself and, and, and who I am, uh, a bit of introduction about GridServe, why and how we are doing what we're doing, um, and then a little bit about EV basics, the stuff that I've learned over, over many years of, of using and operating EVs. And then a little bit about public charging and a little bit about depot charging uh, and my experiences in, that, in those fields as well. Um, so basic intro, uh, my name is Sam Clark. I'm the Chief Vehicle Officer for GridServe Sustainable Energy. Uh, I've been driving electric vehicles for nearly 20 years. Um, I first started in the world of EVs um, by, virtue of, um, by virtue of importing and developing electric motorbikes and scooters uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, I then founded a last mile delivery company in central London using a fully electric fleet. And uh, more latterly, I have now joined the, the ranks of GridServe Sustainable Energy to help uh, encourage uh, the uptake of electric vehicles um, by virtue of um, our charging infrastructure. Right, so um, firstly, moving on to the uh, well to wheel versus sun to wheel, which is my first sort of explanation of, of some of the thought process in terms of this presentation. Um, some of the listeners, some of the viewers may have heard of the phrase well to wheel, perhaps less so um, the phrase sun to wheel. But just to give a basic overview, um, the concept of well to wheel uh, is the extraction and use of oil in order to get through the journey from the oil well to the wheel of um, a particular vehicle. So in doing so, there's a huge amount of effort and energy that's expelled uh, for the, in the first instance, we've got the oil extraction from source. Uh, that then has to be transported. Uh, when it's transported, it then goes through to refinement center. It then gets transported yet again, gets to a petrol station, at which point we put it in our vehicles, we set it on fire and we waste 70% of the energy uh, through heat. So. Obviously, we recognize that oil is still something we need, but certainly not in, in a lot of transportation going forwards. And the analogy or the explanation of well to wheel is one that demonstrates that we simply cannot continue to use this much uh, natural resources um, dug up from the ground in order to fulfill our transportation needs. So the way in which GridServe and, and, and ourselves have looked at it is more of a sun to wheel uh, proposal, uh, which is the next slide here. So rather than spending um, 350 million years waiting for, um, for the, uh, the, the world to give us some oil uh, and destroy natural resources beneath the ground, we very much think that it's a far more um, effective and efficient way to take it from above ground, i.e. Through, through solar and through sunlight. So one of the um, attributes of GridServe that we, we do here in the UK is we build and operate uh, very large solar farms. Uh, in addition to that, we also have what's called hybrid solar farms, whereby we've got large batteries on site as well. Um, the batteries on site are incredibly important because they take in a lot of, obviously take in all of that energy uh, that we are um, extracting from the free resource that is sunlight on a daily basis. And we use that energy to fulfill the needs of the local community by virtue of putting power into people's homes and putting power into, into commercial uh, and domestic operations. As well as that, we're obviously trading on the grid with, through that through that energy as well. So, as a as an overall um, option in terms of harvesting uh, renewable energy and then using it to trade in in those particular parameters, it's an incredibly efficient way and and in a sustainable way of doing it. And of course, the third and uh, last element of that uh, of the sun to wheel journey is to be able to uh, push that energy through the through the cables in the ground to our electric forecourts and then fill vehicles up with renewable energy rather than fuel such as petrol uh, and diesel. So this is very much the, the, the proposal that we have. This is, the, this is our, our mantra. This is what we want to do to uh, deliver sustainable energy, move the needle on climate change. Um, but putting, putting pretty pictures up is all, is all well and good. But what we would also like to do here is demonstrate some real world application of what we're doing. So uh, first picture there is myself. Um, that's me plugging my car in um, to a charger, nothing particularly uh, spectacular. 
Um, apart from the fact that the location I happen to be is in, is in York in, in the north of England um, and it's connected to one of our largest solar farms. So as far as a sun to wheel analogy goes, you can't get much better than that picture. Um, that truly is generating energy from solar going into those batteries, which you can see in the green containers in the background there and put on that energy directly into the car. So that absolutely 100% demonstrates about as renewable and as green as, as one could fuel or, or energize a vehicle. Uh, but not everyone can have a solar farm that large in their back garden. So um, what we need to do is harvest that energy, store it in the batteries and put it into the grid and then deliver it to places like this. So this is our, our first, um, first of its kind in the UK and I believe in the world, which is our electric forecourt. Uh, this electric forecourt has uh, a number of different attributes associated to it. Um, one thing that is not visible on the screen is that we own a solar farm 44 miles down the road that's generating all the energy that's going into the grid. Uh, what isn't also on the screen, because it simply wasn't available at the point when the drone footage was taken, was the batteries. So you can see a little area there with a, um, around the fencing with lots of little concrete pillars. There's, there's now six, six megawatt hours of battery stored on site as well. Uh, what that means in real terms is the equivalent of 24,000 miles of driving energy that we can distribute into vehicles at any given time. Uh, the site also has um, a five megawatt grid connection, which is pretty large. Uh, we have 200, and, uh, 200 kilowatt peak solar array on the canopy there, twin canopy there you can see as well. So we've got lots of on-site generation, lots of off-site generation, lots of battery storage, and of course, uh, lots and lots of chargers, uh, as well as as a building, um, two story building with a number of different um, retail concessions inside as well. So um, if I just give you a couple of images here just to show you some of the some of the um, uh, lower ground uh, imagery, you can see the picture of the building here and the chargers in the background. Um, some more close ups there of our chargers. So we have 36 chargers on this location, um, six of which are Tesla superchargers. Uh, six are AC slower chargers that you might see in a more domestic setting sometimes. Uh, and then we have 24, what's called DC charging, uh, which is the very high powered stuff um, up to 90 and up to 350 kilowatts. I'll explain what that means um, a little bit later. Uh, inside the building, you can see that that's some of the uh, imagery from upstairs in the building. Uh, we've got a car lift so we can put uh, vehicles upstairs. We do leasing as well. Um, as well as a nice area to, to chill out and relax. Um, and there's lots and lots of different seating arrangements, lots of bookable meeting rooms, and it's a whole experience center as well as just the charging location. And that's incredibly important to us to build this sort of um, infrastructure in the UK that, that is a nice place to be, but also an efficient um, and reliable place to charge a vehicle going forward, whether that be a two wheeled electric motorbike, a car, a taxi, a van, or even a lorry or a bus. We wanna make sure that we cater for all needs um, at the same time. In addition to all of that, as well as our electric forecourts, uh, we've also recently acquired a, a, a sharehold in the electric highway, which in the UK is um, a particular network which has an 85% coverage of all service stations in the UK, uh, which is evidence on the map on the right hand side there. So, so in the next uh, six to nine months, we're going to be swapping out every single charger at all of those locations to new modern ones, which are the same as the ones at the grid serve electric forecourts. Um, so that, that really as a business is what we're trying to do. We're trying to create um, you know, renewable energy and we're trying to distribute that in a, in a charging infrastructure people can rely on um, across the country. Um, and that is a overall summary really of, uh, of the GridServe grid serve journey. Uh, right, going into some date details now in terms of some of the charging basics. I've been driving EVs a long time and it can be quite complicated. So I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview um, of some of the things that I've learned and the way that I've um, tried to explain those um, over time. So firstly, uh, is charging charging connectors. What, what does that even mean? Um, well, over the fullness of the last 10, 15 years, we've had all sorts of different types of charging. Um, in the UK, we've typically phrased that as slow, fast and rapid. So slow has always been the, or certainly was in the very early days for my, my tenure in this industry, was a three pin socket as we call it. I think it's a two pin socket in the States. Um, that we would just simply plug into the plug into the um, plug into the wall socket. Uh, very slow charge, but but ultimately that's how we used to charge vehicles back in the day. Uh, then we had a Type Two connector or a Type One connector, and then subsequently a Type Two, which was a delivered uh, can in, in a domestic environment can deliver a very similar amount of charge, but it was a far more robust connector. It was called a Type Two connector. Um, then we got into the more fast charging world, whereby um, we had the same connector type, it looked the same, but could deliver a different level of power going through it. Um, that was typically 
uh, enabled us to charge a little bit faster at home, but also in a, in a commercial environment with what's called a three-phase supply, i.e. A, a, a amount of energy three times as powerful as a domestic setting, we're able to use the same connector to charge three times as quickly. Uh, so that was what we deemed to be fast. Uh, then we moved on to what's called rapid, and we now have rapid, we have ultra rapid, we have high power, they all effectively mean a similar thing in the sense it's the highest level of charging speed that we currently have um, both here and, and uh, in the UK as, as well as elsewhere. Uh, in some contexts, that's still a type two connector. So we've got three different variants of the same connector, looks the same, but can deliver different levels of power. Um, and then in addition to that um, connector type, we also have the what's called CHAdeMO and CCS, so two different types of, of connector, which is typically tethered. So when you go to a charger, the cable is already there. So it's connected one end, and then you plug the other end into your vehicle. And those two are what's called DC charging. It's a different type of, of, um, of energy movement, but it ultimately means that um, you're able to charge those vehicles um, much, much faster speeds than you would in a, in a domestic setting. So that's basically an overview of, of, of the connector types that we are, are familiar with uh, currently. Uh, the next uh, conundrum is what kilowatts mean? What are kilowatts mean? What are kilowatt hours? What are charging curves? What, 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 why, what does that mean? Why is it relevant? Um, well, I'm just going to explain a, li a little bit why it's relevant. So uh, quite often people are confused as to what the difference is between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. So a kilowatt is a unit of power. So I always liken that to a tap with water coming out of it. So depending on how quickly and how, how much you open the tap, water flows out more quickly. So a kilowatt unit, if you've got a trickle charge, that's a lower level of kilowatts. If you pull the tap or turn the tap on full beans and the water's flying out, then you've got a higher level of power or a higher um, unit of kilowatts. So I liken um, the uh, kilowatt phrase to the speed in which the water is coming out of the tap. In the same way, a glass or a wine glass in this example, which is which is um, illustrated on the right there, um, the size of that glass is what's called the kilowatt hour, which is a storage of energy. So how many, how much of that water can you store in a particular vessel? That unit is, is the kilowatt hours. That's the, the level of storage. Uh, translated into the vehicle world, you might have a vehicle with a 100 kilowatt hour battery for the sake of argument. Um, that's the capacity of how much energy that car can hold. If you plug it into a 20 kilowatt supply, i.e. 20 kilowatts of water flowing through a tap, the simple math is you take 100, you divide it by the 20, so 100 kilowatt hours divided by 20 kilowatts equals five. So it takes five hours to charge a vehicle based on those metrics. If you take the same example, but you have a more powerful amount of flow of energy, flow of water, kilowatts, so 100 kilowatt supply into the same size battery, you do 100 divided by 100, you get one, i.e. one hour. So that's just an example of what kilowatts and kilowatt hours mean and how they translate into the vehicle world in terms of an understanding of how long it takes to charge a vehicle. Um, now, that's very, very basic terms. Uh, and then there's what's called charging curves to make it a bit more complicated because that math doesn't always work as, as linear, linear and, a, and as simple as that because there is a thing called a charging curve. So game time. If I was to say to everybody listening, um, if you went to, if we all went to the tap together, had the same size glass and, and the challenge was we all had to fill up that glass with water to brim it to the very, very top as fast as possible. And the winner is the one that could do it the quickest. The only rule is you can't spill any water. And the reason why I give you that challenge is because that's how charging works in a, in a, in a battery in a car as well, um, in the sense that um, what happens with when you when you try and fill up the glass up, you start slowly for a bit and you can turn it up a lot more as, as the glass fills up. And then when it gets to the top, you have to slow right down so you can brim the glass without spilling any. Well, in the world of electric vehicles, it works the same way. So the graph I've, I've got in front of me here is demonstrating um, the level of kilowatts, the power that, um, on the on the y-axis, the, the upright axis, and along the bottom is the state of charge of the vehicle. And this particular example is a Tesla Model 3 long range. So when you plug a vehicle in, the, the curve goes up um, because it gets more and more powerful, as in I'm turning the tap on further and further until it hits the maximum, which in this particular case is 250 kilowatts. It flatlines at that level for a certain amount of time, and then it tails off at the end, hence the, 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 the slow decline of the red line there. And that's what's called a charging curve. So all vehicles go across, go on this journey. Uh, and the next graph here just shows um, a, a, a mix of a number of different vehicles, uh, all with different types of charging curve, but they all follow a very similar pattern. They get faster and faster and they peak at a certain level and then drop off at the end. Why does that happen? It happens because 
electric vehicles need to be protected and the batteries in the cells need to be protected so they're not overcharged. If they're overcharged, they get hot and potentially could catch fire and cause damage. So that all vehicles have to protect the batteries and that's why we have this, this drop off of power at the end. What that means is that in the, in, the, uh, in the world where you're out and about and you're charging a car and you wanna get lots and lots of energy in, you typically can get quite a lot of energy in between 20% state of charge and about 80% state of charge. And that's why a lot of manufacturers will use that, that window of 20% to 80% to demonstrate a meaningful amount of charge. After that point, it starts to drop off and takes a lot longer to get to 100%. Uh, in a domestic setting, when you're asleep all night, it doesn't matter, it takes a while, but that's okay because you're asleep. Um, but in, when you're out and about, it's typically um, a better practice to try and charge between 20% up to 80 or 90% because that's when you'll get the most amount of charge at the fastest rate possible. And it also protects the battery if you don't overcharge, uh, go up to 4%, 100% all the time as well. Um, so that's a little bit around, around uh, connectors, around uh, kilowatts and kilowatt hours and, and charging curves. Uh, the next thing to, to understand, and certainly this, these, these are examples from, from the UK, is uh, connectors, devices, and locations and why they are relevant in the public infrastructure domain. So firstly, what, what is a connected device and location? What, why have I defined it? Why have I separated them out? And the reason is because, um, as is demonstrated here on this, on this um, illustration, um, on average in the UK, this is on average, there are just under two connectors per device and one and two devices per location. So each location is, is as it sounds. Each device, often they have two or three connectors, but only one of them works at any given time. So it's important to understand how many charges there really are. There might be two cables coming out of the device, but if you can only charge one vehicle, it's only really one charger. So um, in the UK, uh, we've got uh, over 40,000 connectors available in the public domain. That only equates, however, to 23,000 devices and only 40, just under 15,000 locations. But that is of every charging type known to man. Now, in, conversely, if we look at the rapid chargers, the ones that you really want to be using when you're out and about and you want a quick charge, mm -hmm. there's only uh, just under 3,000 locations of that type in the UK. So depending on how you look at the numbers, um, uh, will determine how practical and how many chargers there really, really are um, available. Similarly, by contrast, there's 8,000 petrol locations, petrol stations in the UK, 8,500 just under. So even though we have maybe 3,000 rapid chargers and 8,000 petrol stations, each petrol station has maybe 10, 15 petrol pumps, whereas most of the rapid charging locations in the UK only have one or two chargers. So even then, it's not a fair comparison, which basically means we've got a long way to go before we can um, provide an infrastructure which can support the uptake of future EVs. Um, recognizing the fact that in the UK today, there are around one or 2% of the total registered vehicles on the road today are electric. So there's a 98% market, which is gonna to convert to EVs over the next eight or nine years. Um, and we need to make sure the infrastructure is there to support it. Um, just one other way of looking at this uh, as a map of the UK, this is the, all the pins of all of the charges across the whole of the UK and Ireland. Now there's so many of them, you can't even see uh, the land mass. However, when you drill it down to the chargers which have a, a certain um, higher power, um, it suddenly starts to thin. And when we look at the 350 kilowatt chargers, the really, really powerful stuff, such as the, the ones that we have at the grid server electric forecourt, there are almost none in the country yet. In fact, there is as many 350 kilowatt chargers on our one electric forecourt alone than the whole of the country combined. So it just goes to demonstrate that while there are a huge amount of accessible charge points in this country, the ones that you really want to use, there aren't anywhere near as many of them as we, as we might think. Um, hence, hence things need to, need to change. Um, these are just some of the challenges as well, uh, which I'm going to show you now in terms of some of the imagery. And these are pictures that I've taken in my travels over the last few years. So the top three images here uh, show a couple of instances in my BMW i3 where I've tried to charge. The one on the left there looks perfectly fine. I'm charging just fine. Apart from the fact that's a one-way street and a dual carriageway on the left-hand side, meaning it was incredibly dangerous to actually get anywhere near that charger because I had to drive down the street the wrong way because of where the charger was positioned relative to where my charging flap is on my car. Uh, the middle image there is me again charging successfully but parked in a flower bed because the charger is nowhere near the second charging, um, charging bay. Uh, and then the third image there on the right hand side again successfully charging but i'm parked on the pavement and actually on a cycle lane because again the charger is nowhere near the charging bay so where there is infrastructure it doesn't necessarily 
um, meet everybody's needs. Now, my particular German car in this context had a charging flap on the back right, whereas a lot of these charging positioning is dedicated for vehicles with a charging flap on the front left or front middle. Um, so we need to really think about the way in which we present charges for, for, for vehicles in the future so that we don't end up with scenarios like this. Um, where it has worked well in the UK, and these are the examples at the bottom, um, are not without these challenges as well. So the top of, couple of images at the bottom there with the iconic um, uh, British or English taxi, British taxi, uh, the electric version of it, of course. Um, this is a, a, an example of a, of a very, very good charging location over in Hammersmith Flyover in West London. Um, the only problem with those pictures is it's full of taxis, which meant that when I was there, I couldn't charge. And indeed, there was a queue of, of, of taxis waiting to charge. Uh, I drive a Tesla now. And again, bottom right is an amazing location down in the south coast of the UK, where we have a massive, beautiful array of chargers. Uh, just out of shot there is a, is, a, is a farm shop and a playground and a great thing for my family. Uh, the only downside was every single charger was being used. So where there is really, really good infrastructure, it's oversubscribed and will only get more oversubscribed as time moves on. So we really need to make sure that we've got infrastructure, such as the grid server electric forecourt, of course, um, to help deliver this. So that's a little bit about public infrastructure. And the last thing I'm just going to talk about briefly is, is depot charging. Um, so from my previous life as, a, as, a, as an operator of a large fleet of electric vehicles in central London, um, I had a number of different challenges, uh, especially given that I founded my old company in, in 2009 and in a, in a, in a, at the end of a, the, um, the previous uh, global recession, um, as well as a, a, a far less um, a fruitful supply of electric vehicles. So um, this is an image here in 2009 of my first ever depot in central London, which is actually on a, a railway arch beneath um, uh, the edges of Waterloo Station in central London. Uh, I only had a couple of vehicles, um, electric vans and a, and a few electric bikes, uh, but this is how it all started for me. Uh, and then 10 years later, the same business looked a little bit more like this, uh, which is obviously far more industrial. Um, and at this, when this picture was taken, we had over 100 electric vehicles running around central London every day. Uh, now, in order to achieve this, um, not just we didn't just need more electric vehicles, but we needed more infrastructure to go with it. Uh, and this little diagram here just demonstrates how I came about, uh, how I came to, to solve the challenge. So in the early days, when I only had a couple of electric vans, I had plug sockets in the wall. Again, three pin domestic sockets, very simple, but it worked. Only a couple of vans, not a problem. The second I tried to add more vehicles into the mix, I had a problem because the local supply or the, the, grid, the incoming um, grid capacity simply couldn't cater for the number of vehicles that I had. So I had to come up and be creative with the way in which I I solved that problem. And the first way I did that, and this is a story I always enjoy telling, is I went on eBay and I bought a lot of clock timers. Um, I don't know if, you're, if your viewers are familiar with that image that's just appeared under the eBay sign, but that, that is a typically a, a clock timer that we use in the UK to turn lights on and off in the house when we're, when we're not in. Um, I use them um, with multiple chargers, and multiple chargers and multiple vehicles to try and balance the grid. It's, it's uh, it's probably the dumbest smart charging solution known to man, but I had over 50 vehicles at one point charging with three pin sockets uh, with, little, with little clock timers that normally are used for lights. But what it actually meant was I was able to balance the amount of supply of energy that I had relative to the number of vehicles that I had. So um, an infrastructure would have cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, actually only cost a few hundred pounds to, to deliver. Um, it wasn't necessarily scalable, but it solved a problem for a startup with, with, uh, with lower cash reserves than I would have liked. Um, but like any business, you need to move beyond that. Um, so when we started building a, a larger infrastructure with big industrial units, we still ultimately had the same problem because even though we had hundreds of vehicles now rather than tens of vehicles, the same problem was there. As soon as we tried to put in more chargers, we still had grid capacity constraints, but I had gone past the point of being able to do anything with, with cheap three pin sockets on the wall. So um, that's where intelligence needs to come in. And there's a couple of well, three, three major bits of intelligence that we, we delivered to, to site. Firstly, we work with a company such as uh, EO in this particular context, which enabled us to put some intelligence towards our chargers. So we could put um, AC seven or 22 kilowatt chargers in very easily, but we needed the intelligence that was akin to my three pin timers, but doing it in a more algorithmic um, software cloud-based uh, management system just to manage the power of those charges, to make sure that we never went over the uh, overall grid capacity that was available to us. But critically, we also needed telematics. Telematics was very, very important for the vehicles going out 
outside, going going out on the road. We knew where they were. We knew what the state of charge was. But actually, they're incredibly important at the depot, parked up when they weren't moving as well. Because unless we knew what the state of charge is of every vehicle, we can't um, we can't intelligently manage the charging supply. So if two vehicles come back, one's got 90% state of charge, the other one's got 10%, then we want to know which one's got 10% and which bay it's parked at so that we can use and push more power to the 10% state of charge one than the 90. So that ultimately we can get everything charged up in the time we had and the dwell time that was available, but do so in a safe and controlled environment within the, within the constraints of the grid connection. Um, and the last piece of the puzzle was was V2G. So a lot of the vehicle, a lot of the Nissan vehicles that we used uh, were V2G enabled. We had V2G chargers, and V2G, by the way, is vehicle to grid. So what we were able to not only be able to charge intelligently and make sure all the vehicles were charged up at the right times of day for the for the next route in the next in the next morning, but we we're also able to use some of that energy through the night to actually power the building. So sometimes the vehicle the vehicles were asking for for power from the building and sometimes the vehicles were actually powering the building itself depending on the, the overall needs. So we've gone from a very much very basic solution to something a little bit more intelligent. Um, so in the round and, and just to conclude I suppose that that is the, the end of my presentation but I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of, of where I think the overall public infrastructure needs to go. Um, a little bit of understanding perhaps on, on some of the, on, on some of the uh, connecting um, confusion around terminology, uh, a little bit more explanation on that, and also some examples of, of what it's like to, to deliver charging in a, in a depot and a commercial environment. So um, hopefully that was very, very useful. Um, and, uh, and thank you for, for listening. Uh, thanks very much. I think Sam did a great job of showing how far fleet electrification has come in a decade. Um, it's absolutely mind blowing stuff. And I think the future, the future decades are going to be absolutely equally mind-blowing in terms of the advancements of zero emission vehicle transportation. Shout out to the audience if you want to suggest any uh, future videos or if you yourself want to be a presenter for one of these videos, reach out to me. Alternatively, and hopefully, you want to take advantage of the Clean BC Go Electric Fleets program. And if you do, reach out to me at fleets at pluginbc.ca. Have a great day everyone. Cheers.